workers uh, and make uh, human labor uh, redundant. Um, and, uh, but if we look at the last uh, 130 years of data or so, uh, we know that the, you know, the last couple hundred years have been the most technologically innovative in human history. Uh, we have uh, you know, automated ourselves out of agriculture. We've automated ourselves out of manufacturing. We've automated ourselves out of many cognitive tasks, not all the way, but a lot of this work is now done by machines. And yet over the course of this period, uh, labor force participation in most industrialized countries has risen not fallen. More people are working in paid work. A lot of that means uh, women have come out of very constrictive, unpaid labor in the household and moved into uh, potentially more creative, gratifying, and certainly uh, more um, uh, kind of uh, less constrained uh, opportunities for work. So it's useful to remind ourselves why has uh, automation not uh, made us redundant or eliminated our work altogether. And I give you three reasons. And the third one I think is the most important, but let me start with the most mundane. Uh, one reason why we haven't made our work irrelevant is uh, automation uh, or technological change more broadly uh, makes us more productive. It makes us wealthier. And in the course of making us wealthier, it creates all kinds of new demands. Uh, people uh, you know, want larger houses, they want better food, they want to travel, they want more health care, they want more entertainment, uh, they want greater variety in their lives, and that creates new demand for new goods and services and more of the same old goods and services, and that tends to create a uh, demand for new work. So that's reason one. Reason two um, is uh, when we think about automation, we think about it displacing work, and it does. There is no question that automation displaces people from existing tasks. It's almost by definition. We take machine tasks that were done by machines, and we do them instead with people. However, um, it's not all displacement. Uh, automation often makes people much more productive in the tasks that are not automated. That gives us new tools. So, you know, roofers use pneumatic uh, nail guns to hang shingles. Uh, doctors use batteries of tests to make diagnoses. Architects rapidly render designs. Teachers deliver lessons through telepresence. Uh, filmmakers use graphics to graphics called computers to simulate action sequences. People who drive trucks use uh, cloud-based scheduling systems to make sure that they're always their truck is always full wherever they're driving. So the second reason why automation hasn't made us redundant is often in many cases it's giving us better tools to allow us to do the same things more productively and new things uh, that were previously infeasible. And that brings me to the third point, is that technological innovation and automation are crucial to the creation of new work. So this figure, and I'm going to use several figures from ongoing work with uh, Anna Salomons of Utrecht University and Brian Segmeller, who's a PhD student of the MIT Sloan School, uh, looking at the origins of new work. And this figure shows you uh, the distribution of employment across uh, 12 major occupations that collectively encompass all work in the United States. Um, and so the blue bars uh, show you the distribution of employment across occupations in 1940. And you can see in 1940, the largest two categories of work were on the one, farming and mining. I'm hoping you're seeing my cursor. And on the other, in production work, in factory work. The, the, collectively, the two of those things accounted for almost 40% of all employment. Now, the uh, second set of bars shows you the distribution of employment in 2018. And you can see the largest uh, category of employment by far is professional work, um, then uh, managers, a lot of clerical administrative work, and additionally, a lot of personal service work. Now draw your, your eye to the green versus the red bar, uh, great red subcomponents of that bar. The green component of each bar shows you the employment share in occupations that existed in 1940 within those broad categories. The red bar shows you new work, occupations that didn't exist in 1940, that exist in 2018. And you can see collectively, if you stack up, compare the height of the red bars, the green bars, that about 63% of all employment in 2018 is in jobs that did not exist uh, in 1940. So let me give you a sense, what are those jobs? Where do these come from? Well, this figure shows you some jobs added to the U.S. Census uh, in each decade. Uh, so the first one is between 1930 and 1940, the job of automatic welding machine operator was added to the U.S. Census. In 1950, airplane designers. In 1960, textile chemists. Uh, in 1980, controllers of remotely piloted vehicles. In 2000, artificial intelligence specialists. In 2018, pediatric vascular surgeons. So just to step back, 
These are all occupational titles that didn't exist. And then the census added them to their kind of coding manuals because enough people described that as the work that they had to add that to kind of the catalog. Looking at that list, you would get the impression that almost all the new work added is technologically intensive work. And a good deal of it is, although not all of it, as I'll say in a moment. And why is that? Well, new technologies create new demands for expertise. They create new knowledge, bodies of knowledge and specialization that complements human expertise, that requires us to learn new things uh, and, uh, and deploy them. So, uh, you know, there were no uh, airplane designers before, or airplane mechanics before there were airplanes. There were no solar engineers before we had solar cells. Uh, or maybe there were, well, let me skip that. And if you have to look at pediatric vascular surgeons, right, that's one of dozens and dozens of medical specialties. There, we've had doctors for centuries, but they had the, you know, but they did, they, they had a very narrow range of expertise. Now, as technology advances, uh, we have to have uh, many more specialists who know many more, know more things in a narrower realm to stay at the frontier of knowledge. However, not all new work is this technologically intensive work. Um, another good chunk of it actually has to do with uh, services, luxury services that reflect in many cases growing wealth. Uh, so gambling dealers, beauticians, uh, pageant directors, a hypnotherapist added in the 1980s, chat room hosts uh, added in 2000, drama therapists in 2018. And these are actually an important category of the growth of new work. They don't have a technological basis. They reflect rising societal income and the proliferation of products and services uh, that, that are created to satisfy uh, or at least to chase uh, rising wealth. So the point I want to make there is that um, the, uh, you know, the Technology is instrumental, is critical, uh, the combination of new technology and rising wealth in the creation of new work. It is not all about elimination. It's partly about complementing and giving us better tools and partly about creating new needs uh, for human, uh, uh, human expertise. Okay, so that's the good news. Uh, there's no reason to think that technology is eliminating work. Um, however, uh, what we do see, and th this gives you, uh, a lot of my data will be from the US, although not exclusively, uh, this shows you um, the relation, the uh, trajectory of productivity growth and compensation growth in the United States from 1948 to 2018. And if you look at this um, uh, purple line, uh, that is productivity per hour, uh, so a measure of uh, overall labor productivity. Um, and uh, if you look in the first period from 1948 to roughly the late 1970s, it's growing quite steeply in the post-war period. After that, it grows somewhat more slowly, but still pretty rapidly. Um, average compensation, what the average worker receives, also is rising, not as fast as productivity, but pretty, pretty steadily. However, if you look at the median, what you can see is this growing gulf, uh, what some call the great decoupling, between the evolution of median incomes and the growth of overall productivity per hour. And that's a startling fact and very different from what came in the three decades before. In other words, in the first three post-war decades, uh, the median and the average and overall societal productivity rose in lockstep. After that, they diverged. So another way of saying that is an enormous rise in inequality, that the distribution and growth of income has become so skewed that almost all the benefits uh, trickle upward. Now you can look at this figure and quibble and say, did the median really not rise at all? Isn't it, you know, are we under measuring uh, growth in, you know, real living standards? And that's quite possible. It may be rising more than that figure suggests. But if that's true, productivity per hour is also rising faster than that figure suggests. So the gap between the two is a real fact, no matter how you uh, want to uh, worry about the levels of these two figures. So that's a problem. So what went wrong? Why did um, the, uh, the, um, the, why did productivity growth stop translating into shared income growth? I'm gonna say there are three broad causes. Uh, one is technology. Te digitalization of work has made highly educated workers more productive and made less educated workers easier to replace with machinery. So uh, let me give you an example of how this works. Um, this uh, figure, again, from the ongoing work with, uh, with Anna Salomons and Brian Stegmeller, shows you um, the evolution of innovation measured by patented acti patenting activity from 1900 to uh, roughly the present. And these divide innovations into new technology classes. 
And what you can see is in the first part of the century, prior to World War, most of the innovation was concentrated in manufacturing and transportation. That's the blue area here uh, and uh, the dark red area here. In the, uh, in the kind of immediate uh, post-war era, during the post-war and immediately afterwards, a lot of the innovation moved uh, to chemicals, um, which is uh, the brown area, and electricity, uh, which is the purple area. And then things shifted again in the 1980s, and a huge and disproportionate share of all innovation now is occurring in electricity and electronics and instruments and innovation. Uh, in, uh, and these are uh, arguably the most cognitively intensive areas. They have to do with uh, technology around uh, uh, collection, uh, storage, transmission, and processing of information. Well, uh, as innovation has shifted, the nature of new work creation has also shifted. So this shows you between 1940 and 1950, the growth of new jobs, new types of the, this proliferation of new occupational titles, as I was showing you earlier, uh, it, uh, uh, across these occupational uh, structures. And you can see that most of the growth in this period is in the middle of the distribution in construction, transportation, production, clerical administrative support, and sales work. So very high paid work, technical, professional, and managerial is growing, also new work there, but not as fast, and not very much in low paid occupations either. So there's kind of this growth of middle skill, middle paid work, and the new work, that is where it's appearing. If you look uh, in the period from 20, 2000 to 2018, the last two decades, what you'll see is the growth of the arrival of new work is completely bifurcated. Much of it is in technical and professional and managerial work, uh, corresponding to the growth of these uh, information intensive innovations. And then the remainder primarily is in health services and personal services. And when I say health services, I do not mean doctors and nurses, I mean home health care uh, and the kind of custodial health services. And so as innovation has shifted into more and more cognitively intensive work, the arrival of new occupations has also shifted into much more cognitively intensive jobs. And uh, with just this residual of relatively low paid jobs reflecting the growth of uh, incomes and also health needs, primarily done by low paid workers. So why is that concerning? Well, if you look in the US, but more broadly across all uh, industrialized economies, just about, you see this polarization or bifurcation with on the one hand, growth of high pay, high education jobs. On the other hand, growth of low pay, low education jobs, and then the contraction, production, administrative support, office and sales work. And so that polarization, which was the opposite, which was occurring in the first uh, decades after the war uh, is, is what we're seeing now. And that has a very strong technological component. Uh, it's something that's occurring in most places. Uh, and I will also say, let me, in the interest of time, let me not go into this, it's actually occurring more in urban areas than rural areas. Okay, so technology has definitely contributed to the change in job structure, which has created this challenge of the decoupling between the wages at the top and the wages of everybody else, i.e. why the product, so much of the productivity growth tends to be flowing uh, to, uh, to a smaller stratum of workers. A second factor is globalization. Uh, trade and the growth of world trade, and especially China's right, has been a huge positive for world welfare, uh, but it's placed pressure on manufacturing jobs and manufacturing intensive communities. Now, that's not so much the case in Germany, uh, where we ostensibly are meeting right now. Uh, Germany has been a huge uh, net beneficiary from uh, China's uh, uh, growing wealth and demand for uh, luxury and high quality products, although that may be changing. But in the United States, for example, uh, we had a, what many of us call the China trade shock. Uh, this orange line shows you um, U.S. import penetration from China, which basically goes from zero to six percentage points uh, in the course of uh, 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 30, 20 years, excuse me, 30 years. <laughs> 20 years, excuse, no, 25 years, I apologize. Most of that occurring after China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. And as that occurred, US manufacturing employment as a percentage of the population fell from 11% uh, to about 6%. It was an enormous concentrated impact. And that also uh, was uh, eliminated a lot of middle paid jobs and created a lot of economic pressure on communities that were focused on manufacturing. And as many of you will be aware manufacturing is very geographically concentrated, not only where it occurs, but what occurs in specific places. And so when uh, different industries become non-viable as competitive pressure rises from abroad, 
local communities that are concentrated on that activity uh, tend to uh, bear the brunt of that. A third factor that I think has been so important in the kind of decoupling between overall productivity growth and, uh, and the plight of the median worker uh, is uh, weakening institutions, weakening labor unions, historically low minimum wages in the United States, and employment regulations that have not kept up with the changes. Now, let me say, this varies across countries. Um, however, uh, all advanced economies have seen these technological changes I'm talking about, uh, rising pressure from globalization, to some degree declines in labor unions, although again, much less in Germany than other countries. Um, but different countries have pushed back on this more or less successfully. The US has been uniquely, well, maybe not uniquely, but distinctively unsuccessful or hasn't really tried uh, to push back. So for example, uh, this just shows you from the OECD purchasing power adjusted hourly earnings of low education workers in 2015 across countries. So here's the United States at 1033 per hour. Here's our neighbor to the north, Canada, at 1401 per hour, I, a third more per hour, and that is even not accounting for, uh, uh, for example, the availability of uh, health care. Or here's Germany at 1818 per hour. Um, all countries have low paid work. All the countries in this figure have McDonald's employees, but the degree of economic security or insecurity of those workers differs greatly across countries. And that's not because they're doing different work, it's because the institutional structures that uh, support or do not support low wage work differ greatly across the countries. And I think I find it quite uh, a little bit humbling <laughs> uh, to notice that if you want to find a lower wage, low paid worker uh, uh, than in the United States and the, uh, looking across OECD, you'll have to go next to Portugal, uh, Greece, uh, or the Czech Republic. Uh, obviously, we, we can look to the right and see uh, Germany's uh, uh, success there. Um, uh, and uh, also, as I noted a moment ago, uh, collective bargaining uh, meaning, you know, worker representation in some forms is declining in many industrialized countries. So again, here's Germany, uh, and it's fallen from about 85% to about 65%. And I, you all are aware that it has been consequential. But if you look, for example, at the UK and the US, uh, we are outliers. The UK, of course, has just seen this remarkable collapse of collective bargaining. The US starts at a very low level and goes much lower as time proceeds. In fact, collective bargaining is almost non-existent in the United States outside of public sector workers. Uh, simultaneously, again, in the US, the real value of the minimum wage, i.e. the lowest wage you can pay uh, to a uh, uh, employee has, uh, has continually eroded, uh, it is not indexed. And so, although our nominal federal minimum wage has you know, risen in stair steps over time, at its current level, uh, it is basically uh, in 2020, around the same level as it was uh, in 1951, uh, uh, which is extraordinary. Um, so, so let me just summarize the points. I've said, why have things, why have we seen this decoupling? And really there are three major reasons I've argued. One is technology, which has definitely had the effect of, of uh, increasing the value of highly educated workers and making other workers more substitutable. Globalization has placed pressure uh, on manufacturing in particular. And then institutional changes have not kept up with, in many cases, have contributed to these pressures by allowing this kind of decoupling to proceed. So you might say, well, is that worth it? Maybe we need to like, tolerate this level of inequality because we're going to get a lot out of it. it gives, although it's painful for some, it gives rise to uh, dynamism. So let me just say the evidence briefly summarized is uh, it's, inequality does not seem to have a lot of ancillary benefits in terms of economic dynamism or growth. So for example, uh, in the US, uh, labor force participation has fallen steeply uh, over the last couple of decades. This is among men. You might think in a country that had such low wages, everyone would be working because of course, you know, no one is priced out of the labor market. That does not seem to be the case. Uh, similarly, with labor force participation of women in the U.S., it's actually uh, pretty, uh, pretty um, unimpressive uh, relative to the countries to which we compare ourselves. So we're not getting a lot on that margin. Um, a second is the well-known relationship between inequality and earnings mobility, uh, uh, intergenerational mobility. Um, you might hope that countries that have a lot of inequality at a point in time would have a lot of dynamism, i.e. the likelihood that people would go from rags to riches in childhood uh, to adulthood would be higher. But that's not the case. In general, countries that have higher inequality at a point in time have lower uh, mobility, meaning that the 
co correlation between uh, a parent's income and their child's income in adulthood is stronger, meaning less mobility. So here's the US, uh, not a very mobile country. Uh, here is Germany, relatively mobile. Uh, here are the Scandinavian countries, which are always extraordinarily good. If you want to find a, a more immobile country uh, outside of the US, you're going to have to look to China, Argentina, Chile, Brazil, or Peru. Finally, let me just say, and let me not go into this figure, there's not evidence that more unequal countries have grown faster uh, despite their high inequality and low taxes. Okay, so let me, um, in the remaining couple of minutes, uh, I want to leave time for questions. Let me just sort of say something about the technological co and context. Um, and let me summarize it with a single sentence. The momentous impacts of technological change are unfolding gradually. In other words, they are momentous, but they are not happening that quickly. So one uh, nice example, and now one you'll be familiar with, is the rise of autonomous vehicles. And there is, at this point, significant uncertainty related to AV technology, as you know. Uh, there was enormous uh, excitement around this, and it is an exciting technology, uh, but it was dramatically overhyped in the rate at which it was changing. So here's a, a nice headline from the Washington Post in 2018. Uh, Shaken by hype, self-driving leader adopt new strategy shutting up. Uh, and I think that's right, uh, because there was so there was so much overpromising that you might think, well, you know, that what's the harm in overpromising? Well, it created an enormous amount of fear uh, in that, uh, that, that, the, uh, that the driving industry would be eliminated overnight. And it is the case that if we look over the next 30 years, we can forecast some, with some confidence, one to two million driving occupations, driving jobs will be eliminated. Um, but, uh, and they will have big regional components, but it's happening slowly, happening in enough time for us to prepare for it. Uh, and that's important. The rate of change really matters. And this is true across the board. When we look at our task force spent a lot of time looking at different technologies. It's true for autonomous vehicles. It's true for industrial robotics. Some of our task force members, I uh, spent a good deal of time in Germany and we're impressed that although Germans are on the frontier of industrial robotics, how slowly that's moving, how cumbersome the processes are, uh, and how expensive it is. Uh, we are far from the day where robots will be walking among us uh, on uh, streets and shopping malls uh, uh, and uh, doing our housework, much as we would prefer that. Um, intelligence supply chains uh, are kind of you know, the thing that powers Amazon, the notion that sort of machines, transportation devices, people and robots are all kind of working together to deliver products. That has had a big impact. Uh, it's still rolling out. Additive manufacturing. This is a monumental technology. Uh, it has the potential to transform how products are developed and realized. By and large, can eliminate the need for product-specific tooling, for complex geometries. Uh, it can combine parts in more material-efficient ways. Uh, and, and basically turn manufacturing into primarily a digital, not physical process where the physical activity happens at the very end of the line. However, uh, it is uh, going to be many, many years uh, before additive manufacturing is the primary method of manufacturing. And finally, artificial intelligence, uh, as all of us know, is incredibly important, but right now its capabilities are in its infancy and it's used primarily in incremental applications. So, uh, I'm just going to, in the interest of time, let me just summarize. Um, these products and services take a long time. There's new technologies themselves are often astounding, but can take decades from the birth of an invention to its commercialization, its assimilation into business processes, its standardization, its widespread adoption, and its broader impacts on the workforce. So I'm going to close now uh, by talking about what the work of the future, and let me be clear what I mean by that. So. The work of the future is ours to invent. There is a palpable fear of the future in many countries, certainly the United States, and we believe that's a consequence of the divergence between innovation on the one hand and labor market opportunity. And the two have really uh, not kept pace with one another. And looking backwards over the last four decades, US workers would be right to say, wow, it's quite possible there could be a lot of technological advancement without a lot of shared prosperity, without me getting a piece of that. So understandably, people are concerned. They should be concerned. Um, if we deploy the new technologies that are emerging into existing labor systems, we will get the same problematic results. 
we are not on the right trajectory. We are going to see a lot of innovation, a lot of productivity growth, but whether that creates a lot of shared prosperity uh, is highly uncertain. And we would say in our task force that if we do not change our institutions, it's pretty clear we will not create uh, positive results. We'll create a lot of wealth without raising welfare a great deal. Um, on the other hand, we should reject these false trade-offs between economic growth and strong labor markets. There's no evidence in the data that we saw that countries with uh, uh, that had strong labor force market institutions uh, were less productive, uh, grew, uh, grew less rapidly, or had uh, worse opportunity. In fact, just the opposite. So there's an opportunity to uh, have both, to have economic growth and shared prosperity. Finally, the majority of today's jobs had yet to be invented a century ago. The job of the present is to build the work of the future. And that really takes three forms. And these are my last three points. One is that in broadly, institutional innovation must complement technological innovation. It needs to go in hand in hand. One is we need to invest and innovate in skills and training. Uh, of course, everybody agrees with that. It's not controversial. Uh, a second, we have to directly ensure that productivity gains translate into better quality jobs. That doesn't automatically happen, and education training is not enough. It requires other institutional supports. Finally, we need to expand and shape innovation in the directions that we want. As I stressed at the very beginning of my remarks, innovation is a key to new job creation. That's where a lot of the new opportunities come from. So we need to continue to move the frontier outward, but we also need to direct it in the right places. Um, it's much more valuable to apply AI to improve healthcare services and quality and delivery and reliability than it is to replace checkout ca uh, cashiers, for example. Um, governments historically have had a large role in shaping the direction of innovation. In many ways, they have stepped back. And not only has that slowed innovation, but it's also caused it to move towards more immediately commercially viable activities at the expense of potentially more socially important activities. So again, let me just uh, stop by saying uh, the work of the future is ours to invent. There's a lot of possibilities in front of us, um, but uh, we need to use them wisely and I hope we will. So thank you very much for your time and attention and I look forward to your questions. I'm gonna stop my screen sharing now. David, thank you very much for a stimulating presentation. And um, looking at the time, uh, I think we directly jump into the Q&A session. Um, we got some interesting questions from, from our audience, and um, I, um, I'm starting with um, a, um, the following question. Isn't there a lot of informal work in low-pay categories in high-wage countries like Germany? Think of seasonal agriculture workers across Europe. Are these wages excluded from the OECD figures? Does that mean wages appear higher in countries which have high amount of informal work? Yeah, that's an excellent question. In general, yes, they, they, they will not be included uh, in those formal statistics. And uh, in the, uh, so that they, you're correct that those informal workers are not being built into those uh, representative numbers. Now, in general, Higher income countries have much less informal work, but domestic work and agriculture work are the two sectors that in most countries have the greatest level of informality and uh, the greatest uh, possibility of abuse of labor uh, rights for that reason. And uh, creating ways to, I don't know, to organize or at least institutionalize and monitor activities in that sector is very important. So yes, uh, I don't, but let me say, I don't think for example, if we compare, you know, U.S., Canada, and Germany, that informality is much greater in, for example, Germany and Canada and the United States. In fact, I'm sure it's not. Uh, and so the comparison, the levels may be off, uh, but I don't think the actual comparison is skewed. It is still the case uh, that overall uh, wage levels are substantially higher uh, in the, uh, among low-wage workers in, in the countries uh, displayed in that figure. Thanks, David. And there's another question uh, regarding a mini min minimum, minimum wage. Um, what proportion of the U.S. population will benefit from raising minimum wage from $7.75 to $15? And how will this impact the future evolution of productivity uh, and remuneration data you have shown us? And who or what will pay to fill the gap? Good. Okay, great. Uh, so at the moment, very few U.S. workers are paid the minimum wage. It is so low. Uh, I believe it's around 6%. Uh, but depending on how you raise it, it could affect, you know, as much as uh, 15%. Um, 
the, uh, those workers are generally uh, people doing a lot of non-traded services, people doing you know, food service, cleaning, security, uh, entertainment, recreation. Um, it will, uh, so the evidence suggests, uh, strongly suggests uh, that raising minimum wages at current levels, especially in the United States, uh, raises earnings and does not have a strong or even measurable adverse effects in employment when we're talking about employment in these non-traded services or affecting manufacturing, it, it would much more so. And you say, well, how could that be? Like, where does the money come from? Is it just free? And the answer is, no, of course it's not free. Where does it come from? Yeah, it feeds through into higher prices. So if you raise the wage of someone who's cooking the burger, you're gonna raise the price of the burger and that's gonna affect the real living standards of the person buying the burger. However, typically the person buying the burger is more affluent than the person making the burger, uh, it reduces profits. Part of the money comes out of the profit share. And moreover, it even affects uh, the distribution of business activity across firms. So there's recent evidence uh, from, uh, uh, from Germany, actually, by a, a very nice paper by Attila Lindner and co-authors uh, that shows when Germany raised its minimum wage substantially in the 90s, I think it was in the 90s, uh, this had the effect, it did not reduce employment. Uh, it did, however, cause some low, small and unproductive firms to go out of business and cause reallocation of employment from the smaller, less productive firms to higher, to more productive, higher paid and larger firms. So it is not a free lunch. Uh, it has costs and benefits, but the, but the most of the benefits accrue to workers. Uh, and that, I think that's a, an important point I want to uh, pause on. Oh, that's an interesting point. And then... Um... We have another question directing um, uh, into one, you know, concerning one of the, the groups uh, who had um, the, to suffer the most probably during uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, till now. How do you see the future of freelance self-employment? Um, I think we're going to have a lot more of it. Uh, I think that's in, almost inevitable because, you know, we've gotten so much better at delivering work remotely and that means more people will be working independently rather than working within the confines of firms. So I, and I think that creates a real challenge because our labor structures uh, and regulations are built around the idea of the employer employee relationship. We expect to see workers within firms. We know where they're located. We regulate the firms that affects the workers. So I think that this requires us to be innovative with the type of social protections or you know, safety net provisions we provide. So we need to make sure that our retirement systems have mechanisms for people to pay in uh, so that they are covered by retirement, uh, with, that they have adequate savings or pension access when they retire. Uh, it does mean um, that we need to figure out a way to provide some type of unemployment insurance even to the self-employed. The US, for example, did do this under the CARES Act during the COVID pandemic uh, it was an experiment, but it worked reasonably well, and certainly it helped a lot of people who desperately needed help. So I don't think there's, a, I don't have the, you know, a simple answer off the top of my head for how we can do this. But I will say that we built a set of institutions over time to uh, work with the arrangements that we know. As those arrangements change, those institutions uh, are less and less suitable. And so we adapt them. Uh, the problem the United States has had is we, we've had so much legislative gridlock that all, that all we, the best we've been able to do is hang on to the existing institutions rather than see them wholesale eliminated. Um, but uh, we're going to have to step up. Uh, and there's opportunity here. Uh, there's lots of great things about the ability for people to work remotely. It's great that I can be here with you today. Uh, without leaving my house, I wouldn't have been able to make this trip to Berlin. Uh, but uh, we're going to have to adapt uh, the challenge to the challenges that creates as well. There is um, another interesting question regarding uh, the future of retirement. Um, yeah, do you think that's, that it's probably uh, an, an obsolete concept? Uh, no, I don't think it's an obsolete concept. Um, uh, but I think it can be, I think, you know, there's a time in life when people want to stop working and, you know, hopefully have the savings uh, to do so. And, the, you know, there's uh, work is a great thing, but there comes a time in your life when, uh, you would you might potentially want to um, just focus on family and uh, and recreation and hopefully if you if we're wealthy enough as men uh, as most societies are we can afford that or may, most industrialized economies are uh, let me correct myself there uh, so retirement is a luxury that comes with high productivity and we have benefited from the high productivity but we could think of it as being less discontinuous than we do that less all or nothing it's quite possible that people will uh, you know uh, continue to deliver their expertise and their labor skills 
uh, in smaller units, uh, if they can do them without having a full-time job, if they can do them remotely, and that's a good thing. And so we want to have retirement systems that don't kind of force people to make the all or nothing choice, but rather support those transitions. Um, and again, that requires institutional innovation, but it's a, it's a positive opportunity. And let me sort of, you know, kind of, I think in this is the direction of the question, as societies have gotten wealthier, the number of hours that we work per year has fallen dramatically from you know, 5,000 to 4,000 to typically in, in many uh, industrialized countries, it's under 2,000 hours per year. So it's sort of like we're all retired a bit all the time <laughs> in the sense that we don't work seven days a week. We don't work from sun up to sundown. Uh, we don't work until the day uh, that we pass away. Uh, we have more time for leisure, more time for family, more time for recreation, more time for learning, more time for pursuing intellectual interests. And that is a benefit of rising productivity. Uh, and it's a benefit that we should use uh, wisely to allow people to retire, to allow people uh, to have uh, uh, good paying jobs um, that support, provide economic security, uh, even if they're not doing uh, the most uh, skilled, advanced and specialized work in the economy. Thanks, David. We're getting so many interesting questions in. And um, yeah, we should probably take this as, as the last one. Um, Looking at educational policy instruments such as retraining and lifelong learning in the context of the current pandemic, how can incentives for reskilling be democratized so that they are not limited to those who are already more resilient to digital shocks and are more likely to take advantage of tax incentives and lifelong learning opportunities? Good. So they recognize the reality, which is the people who are best at learning are the people who are most educated. Uh, and they're the best at retraining themselves they often also have the resources to afford that. So we need to create um, skills, skilling systems that are much more flexible and have many more points of entry than, uh, than is traditionally the case. Now the US among its many shortcomings actually has uh, one virtue of flexibility. There's, you can always in the US, you can always go on for higher education, you can always change careers. You're not, you don't have this kind of critical moment uh, at which you have to make that decision. Uh, although, of course, it's easier or harder at different times. Um, Germany, for example, and many European countries have superb skilling systems and vocational education programs, uh, but they are very life cycle targeted and they are often very all or nothing. That Once you've made the choice, you don't get to go back. That can change. And an important thing that's going to uh, support that change is we now are on the cusp or are developing, uh, and I, when I say we, I don't mean me personally, <laughs> amazing opportunities for learning, right? Education and skilling should be getting much cheaper, much more accessible, meaning you can do it from anywhere, and much more interesting than it has historically been. Reskilling adults has always been hard. Adults don't do well being sent back into the classroom and made to sit for, you know, day-long sessions of people writing on blackboards. But that doesn't any longer need to be the case. Uh, we can deliver education remotely, but more importantly, we can deliver it more engagingly when augmented reality and virtual reality uh, become more uh, readily accessible and available as they will in the next few years, it'll be possible to learn many, tra many crafts, many trades by simulation, by doing them virtually, like experiencing them as if they're occurring and yet uh, you're not actually physically there. So I think we're in an age of educational innovation opportunity that we have never seen before. Education has been getting more expensive all the time because it's labor intensive. Uh, it requires concentrated physical location. It's not getting much productive, more productive over time. So it just gets more, more costly. And that is about to change sign. It's going to get cheaper and more interesting uh, and more accessible. And so that creates opportunities for lifelong learning. And again, let me say, I've said this at every point, to every question, it requires innovation. It requires taking advantage of new possibilities to uh, create new institutions new uh, opportunities, uh, new modalities. However, we have the tools available to us in a way we never have had before uh, to accomplish these things. So I'm cautiously optimistic. When I say cautiously, uh, I'm discouraged by how uh, many countries, especially my own, have misused the last four decades of rising productivity, have not used it well to advance opportunity. But I'm encouraged that we have lots of possibilities ahead, lots of technologies to assist us with this, and lots of rising productivity to work with. And so it is uh, up to us collectively 
to uh, build the work and the institutions of the future that kind of realize the possibilities uh, we would like to see. Thanks, David. That was, I think, a good word to end on. Um, we learned a lot, we heard a lot, and I think um, we'd love to um, talk to you again probably when the pandemic is kind of over, uh, probably in a year to see uh, what's probably changing till then. And, um, and we very much hope that you enjoyed it with us. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, we now take a short break and we'll be back in a few minutes with a panel on uh, German, the German Council Presidency and Europe's quest for digital sovereignty. Thank you so. very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. I really appreciate the questions. I hope uh, the answers were even half as good as the, uh, the questions that were asked. So, nice to see sure. you. Sure. Thanks, David. Bye and see you soon to all participants. <laughs>